So yes, I'm a creative engineer at Google. And today, I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about uh, creative engineering and the future of tech. So if you rewind back to the first day, you heard the talk about seeing the bigger forest or seeing the individual tree. This is going to be more about seeing the forest and all the different industries that exist, different companies I've met on my journey, and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> OK. So <clears throat> to kick off, what is a creative engineer? Good question. Uh, there's literally dozens of us at Google. In North America, there's only three of us. And um, essentially, my role is to investigate all the new technologies coming out, one of which is machine learning, but also things like augmented reality, virtual reality, projection mapping, all this kind of stuff too. And we work with Google's top 150 customers globally. And when they're launching a new product or service, we have to come up with a new idea that's never been done before to tell their story in an innovative way. So every week for me is like starting a new startup. Every idea is different to the last, and it's trying to make a minimum viable prototype to do that. Hypothetical example, this is not a real example. I can't talk about all the work I've done. But basically, uh, if someone said, OK, we want to make a hoverboard, I cannot say no. I've got to say yes, but, and then find a way to do that within the constraints of, of my knowledge of different technologies. So you could use electromagnetism in this case. Once again, I didn't make this, but just an example. <clears throat> so I'm going to start off by recapping um, what I saw at CES this year. CES is the Consumer Electronics Show held every January in Vegas. And this is where all the big companies, Samsung, Google, all these guys come and show off the latest technologies that they've uh, been developing. And I'm going to start off with um, Haptex. Has anyone seen the movie Ready Player One? A few, any hands? OK, cool. So in that movie, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's um, a group of kids in virtual reality. And they've got these special suits they can wear to fill things in virtual reality. OK, so when they touch each other, they can feel those interactions and so on and so forth. Well, Haptex has made these gloves that allow you to fill things in virtual reality that do not exist in the real world. Okay? And these gloves are really, really cool. Uh, how do they work? Essentially, um, they've got over 200 individually controllable rubber membranes that can inflate and deflate 100 times a second, or up to 100 times a second, um, to create the illusion of touch. And in the demo they have, they have this little spider. So if you're afraid of spiders, it's the worst demo ever. But the spider will crawl onto your hand, and you can feel the spindly legs crawling on the palm of your hand. And then in your right hand, you can pick up a fox with like, larger paws. And you can feel the difference between the spindly legs and the larger paws. Really, really cool technology. But what's even better is that if there's something solid in the uh, VR scene, like a plank of wood or something like this, and you go and touch it, you actually will create resistance. So on these fingers here, this will stiffen up, so it feels like a solid piece of wood to your brain. And the effect is the best I've actually um, um, felt in my time of demoing this kind of stuff. Um, so if anyone's going to make that suit from Ready Player One, it's going to be these guys, in my opinion. So very cool technology. Um, next up is something similar um, from a company called Ultra Haptics, who's actually from my University of Bristol back home in England. And they are trying to recreate feeling things in midair, but without the gloves. And how they do that is to use um, ultrasonic so uh, sound waves and highly focus them in 3D space. This creates this kind of really weird sensation. It's kind of like a light blowing, but it can, it can kind of pulsate it as well. So you can feel the things in front of you. So in this screen, this is a special screen. It's a lenticular display, which basically means I can see in 3D without the 3D glasses that you go to for the cinema. Um, so these orbs here are actually floating in front of me on the desk in this, in this, uh, in this photo. <clears throat> So when I reach out and touch one of these orbs, I can feel this like, magical kind of energy to know that I've selected that, that orb, and I, I can then interact with the game, and so on and so forth. So once again, very cool technology from a different approach. Um, in the future, we're going to be taking calls with our finger. Forget your smartphones. Forget all those speakers that you have. This technology uses body conduction to send the sound waves across your hand. And when you touch your ear, it will convert into sound to your eardrum. So first of all, that's just really cool. And um, then secondly, um, it connects via Bluetooth. So this, you wear this little strap on your wrist here. And that's got a microphone in there too. So you can then, of course, talk back and talk to the person on the other end of the phone, which is just Bluetooth connected to your mobile device. Now, what's really interesting here is that um, there's also creative potential. This is for taking phone calls. But what if I just went up to you and touched on the ear to give you a secret message? There's lots of creative potential I could do here using this kind of technology. So very, very interesting stuff. Real life Photoshop. This company has created this wand device that will literally print makeup on your face by scanning your face 200 times a second. So you only put the makeup in the places that it's required. 
Um, this will be launching later this year. It's by Procter & Gamble. And um, there's several benefits to this. One, it's faster to apply the makeup, and you're using less makeup. And because you're using less makeup, you actually uh, are benefiting your skin, because your skin can breathe more, essentially. And the difference between regular makeup application and this is night and day. It's like a tiny little bit versus a whole like, cloth full of makeup when you try and scrub it off your face. So once again, this is coming out later this year, and it's worth keeping an eye on. Um, Exmos. I used to work for Exmos before I joined Google, and they had, happened to have a booth uh, at CES this year. And they're investigating the future of assistants. So obviously, we've got like Google Home, Alexa, all these kinds of things in our house. And they're trying to revision what that could look like in the future. Now, what's going on here is when you say the magic words, hey, assistant, whatever it is, um, it will figure out where in the room you are using machine learning, and then it will turn the speaker to point to only you. Okay? And this speaker is a very directional sound uh, speaker, so only you will hear the response. So even in a crowded room, it will talk only to you. So if you ask it your calendar today, only you will hear the response, and everyone else will not hear your calendar events. Okay? Um, for those of you who have not tried directional sound before, it's kind of really weird. It sounds like it's inside your head when it actually reaches you, which is really bizarre. It doesn't sound like the sound has come from outside of your head. It sounds like it's inside your head. I can't explain it any more than that, but just try it one day if you ever get the chance. It's quite, quite cool. Um, <clears throat> Orcam is making a wearable AI companion. This is a tiny little device that fits in your shirt pocket, like um, around here. And essentially, it allows you to identify the people you're speaking to. So let's say you're at a networking event. It can read the name badge, and then it will record uh, the face and the name by transcribing the text automatically. Okay? Now, what's really cool is that this is all done offline. It's not connecting to the cloud. It's not syncing with the cloud for privacy reasons, of course. And even the imagery that it takes is not stored on the device ultimately. Once it's done the machine learning on it, it just stores the weights and does not store the images. So it's very secure in that sense, too. But what that means is when I go up to this guy later on in the day, and let's say he's got like a, a little Bluetooth headphone in his ear, it will automatically recognize me and say, hey, this is Jason. You met him last at 9 AM in the morning. And he can look all confident and stuff that he, he remembered me. It's a better conversation. Now, this originally started as a method for enabling people with visual impairments to understand who's around them. So it was initially for accessibility. Um, but it turns out people like me have face blindness as well, and it's really useful for networking events. So it's now got a wider application, and they're trying to demo that at CES uh, as well. Retail meets artificial intelligence. There's a big push towards retail analytics. Um, so we can see here, if you combine things such as um, pose estimation, or um, uh, segmentation of, of humans versus the background, estimating their sex, their age, and all this kind of stuff, you can actually get a very good picture of who someone is in your shopping mall. And as they're walking around, say they're on aisle three looking at the biscuits, you can actually understand that they've, they've dwelled there for a certain amount of time. So clearly, they're interested in that thing that they're looking at. So that means when they go down to aisle 16, you might have some digital signage um, which you can then show an ad targeted just for them to give them 10% off those biscuits they were looking at earlier on in the store, and then hopefully entice them to go back and get those and increase your sales. Um, so this is, you know, they're proposing this as a whole package solution. Um, I'm not sure if it's being used anywhere yet, but this is a sign of things to come in the future. This can happen. Um, <clears throat> AR is starting to get stylish. Um, of course, we've started off with many interesting pieces of hardware in the past. And now, finally, we're getting these things that look like regular glasses. But these are not regular glasses, of course. These are fully augmented reality uh, with, with uh, slam detection and all this kind of stuff built in. So if I place an object on this table here, I look around, and when I look back again, the virtual object I've placed will be exactly where I left it on that table, because it understands the environment around it as well. Okay? Um, so it's getting more compact, a longer battery life, brighter display, so things look more vivid when you look through the, through the glasses as well. Um, so this is a very exciting area to be investigating at the moment as well. <clears throat> um, smartphones, they have bunches of sensors in them, right? We've got tons of sensors. We've got accelerometers, gyroscopes, all this fun stuff. What's the next sensor going to be in a smartphone? I feel the thing that could be most useful to us is molecular sensors. And this company, SCIO, has produced a smartphone with a molecular sensor in, such that you can hold it up to these apples, and it will tell you which apple to eat first or not to eat, 
based on its rightness or if it's gone off or if it's uh, underwrite, that kind of stuff. And of course, it can do that because it can detect the chemicals produced by that uh, object, essentially, and analyze that. So one more sensor that might be added to our smartphones in the not too distant future. This is an embarrassing one for me, um, ginormous head on the screen here. But what's cool about this is that this 3D capture of my head was done just using my smartphone and a bit of machine learning, of course. So all I did to do this was hold up a smartphone to my face, turn right, turn left, and within five seconds, I had a 3D model of my head with high resolution. You can see you can zoom right into my nose and see all the hairs and things there. So basically, um, Machine learning is making things faster to capture as well, especially in 3D scanning. Before, we need those very advanced uh, laser scanners to do high-resolution captures of, of objects. But now you can just use your smartphone and get very similar results. Um, talking about faces, if we move over to China, um, Alibaba allows you to pay with your face. We're quite prehistoric over here in the USA with our credit cards and stuff. You can actually just use your face over in China. And the way it does this is it analyzes your face and identifies 4,000 unique points on your face, such that if you're wearing makeup or a wig, it still knows it's you. They are pretty confident that it's robust. If you want to see how they do that, they actually acquired a company called Face++. Um, we'll send out the links afterwards, and you can see that company in more detail. Um, but it, I tried it out, and it, it works pretty well. It's very interesting. And it's great not having to carry credit cards around. Um, I think for larger purchases, they do require a pin just to double authenticate. But for small purchases, it's just use your face and you're, off, and you're ready to go. <coughs> Emotional Robotics. Now, this is a really interesting company. Um, this little dude is called Liku. He's from Korea. And I saw him with his mother, if you will, walking around the show floor. And he turned around and looked at me right in the eyes. And he kept looking at me as he was walking around the show floor with his mum. I thought, OK, I've got to go talk to this robot. It's so cute. So I went over to the robot and asked if I could hold the robot. And what I didn't expect was the reaction from the robot when I held him in my arms. He got super excited. He, his eyes lit up, as you can see, literally bright white over there. And um, when the, he realized a photo was being taken, he, he loved that. He was like a proper selfie robot lover kind of thing. So <clears throat> my point here is that this is the first time I've seen humans get emotionally attached to robots. Just for a second, I felt like a father. And I'm not a dad, but just for a moment, I felt like one. And I, I observed this for a little while with other people in the show floor. And the same reaction again and again, um, the maternal instinct kind of kicked in, especially with the, with the women in the room as well. They really felt like it was like a little baby. And I've not seen that before with a robot. So this is very interesting research. Um, and I believe there's very interesting applications here for therapy or advanced toys, that kind of area. Um, and they're currently based in Korea. So a very cool company to check out. So that's a few cool examples of companies at CES. But let's just rewind a little bit to the public perception of AI and ML. Obviously, your end customers are going to be the general public. But what kind of state of mind are they in uh, right now? Um, so let's rewind again to the mobile first um, big kind of revolution. A few years ago, there was a big push from desktop to mobile. If you weren't on mobile, you weren't in business. Okay? And of course, as you all are all aware, the same kind of change is happening again, but with an AI-first approach. Every industry is going to be influenced or um, affected by AI in some shape or form. Now, there's a really cool blog called Wait But Why. Some of you may have seen this before. For those of you who haven't, I've taken a few images that are my favorites from this blog, and I'll just go through them right now. So this is basically the public's perception of artificial intelligence. We've got uh, intelligence versus time. There's ants, birds, chimps, kind of equally spaced at the bottom there. And we've got a regular human, a big jump up from a chimp. And we've got someone like Einstein, which is a big jump up from the regular human. And AI is this kind of linear line approaching chimp level, doing some basic jobs quite nicely. And that's what people think about it right now. Now, if of course, if we believe this, this is completely wrong. It's more like this. And ant, bird, chimp, and regular human are equally spaced. And the Einstein is only a tiny bit more intelligent than a regular human in the grand scheme of intelligence. Okay? And of course, AI is this exponential curve that's shooting up right now, getting better and better, much faster than anticipated. Now, another way to look at this is human progress over time. And what the author is proposing here is that human progress is in terms of innovation, um, technological progress, that kind of stuff. And he thinks we're standing right here at the beginning of his uptick. So in the next 10, 30, 20 years, something in that kind of time frame, we actually may make more human progress than we have in the entire human history of our being alive. Okay? 
That's a really interesting thought, and it's an interesting time to be alive to be part of that big uh, progress upwards. Um, <clears throat> cool. So what about common use cases? What do people kind of associate with AI these days? Well, obviously, a lot of apps these days have object recognition in them. So people are quite familiar with this concept of pointing your phone at something, getting results, that kind of stuff. Even with AR, that's also kind of um, a complement to that. Uh, speech recognition, uh, obviously, everyone's got their Google Homes in the house or Alexas. They're comfortable talking to their mobile phones. Speech recognition is kind of bread and butter these days. Even at Google, we see a massive increase in voice searches on Google Search as well. Um, natural language processing, of course, things like sentiment analysis exist, but also for chatbots and all this kind of thing, people are now becoming more aware of those as well. Um, there's creative potential such as style transfer, um, and once again, there's lots of apps doing style transfer to do your face in a certain artistic style, that kind of stuff. Um, predictive capabilities, so all those mortgage calculators and all that kind of thing, of course, behind the scenes, they're using AI to calculate your credit scores and all that kind of stuff, I'm sure. And then um, translation as well, converting between languages, things like Google Translate. People are familiar with that. And then my personal favorite is restoration and transformation. And the best way to describe that is by an image. Uh, this is research from NVIDIA. Some of you may have seen this before, but the key thing to note here is that these faces do not exist. They're all completely made up, dreamt up by the neural net. Um, and it's getting pretty good now. These faces look very realistic. Okay? And people are starting to be more aware of this with the things like deep fakes that are more kind of mainstream in the media, but um, they are aware that this kind of technology exists. <clears throat> so how is Google using machine learning then? Um, essentially, the growth at Google has also been exponential, just like the graph we just saw. This only goes up to 2016, but you can see we reached around 4,000 repositories using AI, ML in some kind of capacity. Okay? Um, you may know about some of these, but I'm going to go through them for completeness. So Google Photos allows you to search your phone for photos you've taken using various keywords like cats, dogs, sunsets, skiing, whatever you like. And even though you've not tagged them as such, we can bring back the photos that you have in those situations. So it saves you a lot of time when you're in the bar trying to show your friends the latest holiday you've been on. You just get those beach photos straight away rather than having to scroll through it. Uh, Gmail and Inbox can use natural language processing to understand the uh, email that just came to you. And then with one tap, you can give an uh, a automated reply, which basically summarizes what you're probably going to say anyways. So if you're busy or you're walking around, you don't have time to reply in the moment, you can just tap and you can deal with it later. And then a quick shout out to robotics. We've got this thing called an arm farm at Google. These little arms are trying to learn how to pick up objects. And as humans, we take this for granted. Objects are you know, easy to pick up, right? But actually, they have different textures, different surfaces, different shapes, different centers of gravity, weights, all this stuff. And there's actually a lot of stuff that can go wrong when you're trying to pick up a simple object. You've got to estimate all of that before you can pick it up correctly. So these arms are working in parallel to learn how to do that. And because they're connected via the cloud, when one learns, they all learn at the same time, which is kind of nice. But what's even cooler is that if you simulate this in virtual reality, you can um, actually get most of the way there using virtual objects and virtual arms, which, of course, reduces costs. So instead of having 10 arms, you can have 1,000 or 10,000 arms in virtual reality training on virtual data. <laughs> and then once they got pretty confident with that, you can then bring that model to the real arms to then finish off the last x percent to um, refine it more for the real world. So the reason I put this in there is because I'm not saying this applies to everybody, but maybe there's a way you can simulate some of the data that you have to train on virtually and then do the last mile with the real data you have, especially if you've got uh, less data to hand. <clears throat> um, and then there's a whole bunch of other Google products and services that I won't go into right now that use AI or ML in some uh, hybrid way. <clears throat> Has anyone heard of AutoDraw? Sure OK, a few people. For those of you who haven't, essentially on the left-hand side there is a picture of a cat, which I drew myself with my own fine hand. And on the right-hand side, Google has recognized it as a cat and give me the perfect clip art. So now even an engineer like me can make drawings that are really respectable. Um, now what's cool here is that um, this was trained by asking hundreds of thousands of people to draw many, many different types of images, chairs, tables, cats, dogs. And we actually understood the, 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 the line strokes they were doing to create that piece. And because we did it at that level, um, the ML system can now actually draw new versions of a cat I drew to give like, different um, outputs that look like a human drew it, even though I never drew those ones. So you can actually have variations on this one to get more variety, to be more creative. Okay? 
And the other cool thing to point out here is, is um, being responsible when you're designing these systems. So this was a worldwide data collection situation. And one thing we learned from this is that when you draw something as simple as a chair, you can do the back on the, uh, the, left, the right hand side, and then the chair jutting out to the left, and then the legs on the bottom. But if you're in China, you might, you might draw it the other way around, with the, ch uh, the chair on the left coming out to the right, and then the legs on the bottom. And if you don't have that data, you're going to misclassify one or the other as not a chair. So this is why you should be inclusive, and back to the um, unconscious bias. This is an in interesting one which we didn't even think about, but we realized existed after looking at all the different types of chairs drawn. Um, so it's not always obvious that this bias exists in your data sets. So be aware of that, which was from the other talk as well. So you know all about that now. Um, Soli, who's heard of Soli? <coughs> One person, okay. So basically, Soli is a tiny little chip developed by Google that sends out radio waves to the world around it. And depending how those waves bounce back again, um, we can use machine learning to understand the interactions that happened in the space around. So these fine hand-controlled gestures can control the smartwatch on your wrist, for example. So no more fiddly tapping on screens. But what about situations where you don't have a screen, your refrigerator, your headphones, and other things like that? Just with a quick gesture, you can control that uh, potentially in the future. Uh, pixel buds. Any pixel buds fans in the room? Oh, one or two people. Okay. Well, basically, this is essentially Google Assistant in your ears. These were released for the new Pixel phones that came out not too long ago. And what's cool here is that if someone's speaking to me in Chinese, I can hear it in English in my ears in almost real time using Google Translate. Uh, of course, Google Translate can be a bit funny sometimes, but it's still way better than my Chinese ability to understand is. So, and let's just appreciate how cool that is. I grew up with Star Trek when I was a kid. And it had that thing called a universal translator. And um, we've now basically got one of those it, it working in the real world. And you know, it, it not too far uh, into the future, who knows what we'll have after that as well. Google Lens, this was actually announced at I.O. 2017. It's been evolving over that time, of course. And uh, this is available on the latest Pixel smartphones from Google. Essentially, built into the camera app itself, you can hold your phone to the world around you and get contextual information. So I can hold my phone up to a, a restaurant across the road. It will identify what restaurant it is and bring in the reviews, the ability to book, the photos of the food automatically without even having to walk across the road to get that information. Uh, or maybe I'm trying to buy some flowers for my girlfriend. I see them in the wild. I don't know what they are. I can just simply um, hold my phone up to the flower. It will tell me what flowers they are. I can go to the florist and order the right ones. Okay? So visual search is very important, and it's only getting stronger with time. So let's talk a bit about how others are using machine learning, including my team and also external to Google as well. Okay? Now, these things are a little bit more futuristic. Um, so these are not necessarily scalable solutions right now, but you can get an idea of what's happening. Um, first up, robotics, Boston Dynamics. Um, these guys are making super cool robots. As you can see, this one's doing a backflip. I cannot even do a backflip. So this robot is better than me. <laughs> um, now, there's a question online whether or not Boston Dynamics is using machine learning for this particular use case. However, I have seen research whereby machine learning is used to teach robots to walk, or if, you, um, if they lose a leg or something, they can adapt in real time to then learn how to walk with two legs instead of three, or whatever it might be. Um, so machine learning can be used for this kind of stuff. And this is a very exciting area. If you ask me like, just 10 years ago, would we have these, this kind of dexterity in robotics? I'd be like, no, we've got, we've got way longer to go. But lo and behold, here we are with very, very cool robots being produced. <clears throat> Style transfer, I touched on this very briefly earlier. Essentially, take your favorite image, take your favorite artist, and get the image in the style of your favorite artist. Um, now, the key thing to note here, this is not just a fancy Photoshop filter, right? This is machine learning. And because it's machine learning, um, it means you can move around in high dimensional space and all that fun stuff. Um, so you can get variations on that effect. Okay? And even better, you can choose how much of the content comes through in the original image or how much of the style comes through. So you can have more or less of that and have variations on that effect. So you can really customize it up in a fun way. And this can be done in real time as well now on, 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 on the, in the web browser. So you can just turn yourself into a painting via webcam. It's kind of cool to see that. So, yeah. um, Video generation, this is actually older research, but I just want to touch on it because it's quite cool. So this um, person has tried to create tiny little videos of certain scenes, like a beach scene, a golf scene, a train station, babies. You look at the baby's faces, and something was really bad, badly wrong going on there. But you saw the face research at the beginning of the talk as well, the NVIDIA one, which is much, much better. So this will improve with time. But the key thing I want to kind of propose here is what if in 10, 20 years, as a Hollywood director, 
I can simply say, hey, I need a clip of a guy getting onto a train for my movie, and it can generate it. There's no royalties, there's no fees, because it's being dreamt up by the AI system. We are certainly heading in that direction, and this is the very first stages of that. Skip port vectors. What happens when you have two ML systems working together? One has been trained to describe photos, and the other has been trained on romantic novels only. You combine them, and you get something like this. He was a shirtless man in the back of his mind, and I let out a curse as he leaned over to kiss me on the shoulder. Now, clearly, this is a fighting scene, which is not appropriate for this phrase, but if you can only describe things in a romantic novel way, you may describe the photo as such. So once again, this is a great example of machine learning being creative and using it in a creative way. <laughs> um, cameras are your entry point to understanding the world around you. So we touched this with lens, but before lens existed, someone made this thing called the thing translator. And the reason I have this here is because it's a very simple idea, but executed very well and is very useful. Sometimes simple is best. And all it does is it recognizes an object in the world around you, it converts back to another language, and it displays it on the screen. Okay? And you can then learn how to say things in a different language. Very useful when you're abroad and not knowing the language. right? Um, now, a few years ago, this would take a small research team, a grant, and all this kind of stuff, and uh, a lot of money to do. But something along these lines you can do in just a couple of hours with a couple of lines of JavaScript and the APIs you'll see later. Um, obviously, more advanced visual recognition, they still need to do research there. But for something like this, for common objects, it's quite easy to do that right now. <clears throat> um, dragon spotting. This is one from my team that I worked on personally. Um, this is a, there's a movie called Peach Dragon. Yeah, I don't know if anyone's seen that. It's more for the kids. But basically, the premise of this movie is that only children can see the dragon in the movie. So I was thinking, how can I bring this to life in the real world for the real children? In the, okay? So what we did here to combine augmented reality and machine learning together, so you go around your home, and you look for common objects we believe most people would have, like a plant, a TV, a chair, a sofa, something like this. Um, and once we knew you were looking at the object, we could augment Elliot the dragon into the scene, so you could take a photo of the dragon in your house and then prove to your parents that you really did see the dragon and you're not going crazy. And of course, ultimately, get butts and seats for cinemas, which is our ultimate goal there. But um, this was a good creative use case of using machine learning to, in a creative way to do that. Predicting complexity, identifying patterns and behaviors at scale. Who plays Go here? Anyone plays Go? Don't be afraid to put your hands up. No one plays Go here. OK, so <clears throat> Go is a board game, much like chess. The difference being the number of moves you can make in Go is so large that there's actually some crazy fact, like less grains of sand on Earth than there are possible moves in the game of Go. Okay? So one cannot simply pre-compute all the information needed to play this optimally uh, and see the end result ahead of time. You've got to play each play optimally, and that requires some level of intelligence. And because of that, many people thought that this was not a solvable problem for computers to beat the human experts at. But lo and behold, AlphaGo, which is created by DeepMind in London, which is owned by Google, uh, beat the world champions at Go not too long ago. Too many Go's in that sentence. But basically, um, it even taught them some moves they hadn't even considered before, which is kind of cool. So it actually evolved to be more creative and teach them other things. There's a whole Netflix documentary on this that I recommend checking out if you're interested. It uses reinforcement learning to learn how to, do, how to play the game. And that will go into way more details than I can right now. So check that out if you're interested. <clears throat> Optimizing user experiences, designing for context and personalization. Of course, Spotify is a great example of this. Um, when you listen to a few tracks on Spotify, you're going to get recommendations for other songs they think you're going to like. And it works pretty well. Now, their exact secret source is secret, but we can take a guess here that they're using things like beat matching, understanding the lyrics using natural language processing, the artists, the kind of you know, rhythms and styles, all that kind of stuff are input into, into their machine learning system, and then it outputs uh, suggestions based on that, right? So very cool use of ML there, too. Project Muse is another one by my team. What happens when you combine humans and AI together? So individually, we're not very good, but combined together, we can do things greater than our, our parts. So in this case, um, we are aiming at fashion designers. And I don't know if any of you are from, from a creative background, but often you can get creator's block. You are trying to design something, and then you just don't know where to go from there. So you go and have a coffee, you come back, and hopefully some inspiration comes to you in that time. Well, here, the AI is the inspiration. It understands styles and designs that are kind of common right now, and it will suggest alterations to the piece of fabric you're working on in real time to help you get out of that block uh, and then keep iterating and moving on in your design process. 
So that's a very interesting piece to, uh, um, evolving there. <clears throat> Uh, conversing with users, natural interactions in everyday lives. Who here has children? Anyone have children here? OK. So this is a collaboration with Disney that we did called Book Ears. If you put your Android smartphone on the chair next to you and you start reading a book to your son or daughter, we can understand when you say the words, and then the dragon roared, and we can make the sound of a dragon roaring through your speakers at that moment to bring the book to life, which makes storytelling much more interesting and immersive, right? And of course, if you've got a really smart, smart home, you can even flash the lights if it's a thunderstorm or something and all that kind of stuff, too. Um, so this was a nice experiment in that kind of space. <coughs> Westworld. Who has seen Westworld? And who, OK. And who hasn't seen Westworld but doesn't want any spoilers? <laughs> OK, good. So if you, do, if you are worried, just put your hands on your ears. But basically, Westworld is a TV series. And one of the characters in there is called Aiden. And it turns out Aiden is an AI entity. OK. So we thought it would be really cool to bring Aiden to life using, well, AI, of course. So we used natural language processing to recreate Aiden so that he could answer in real time across the world questions from the fans about the new series that was coming out, or the Westworld universe in general. Um, and this led to over 400,000 unique conversations and even won an Emmy Award for being one of the first times to bring a character to life using NLP. And basically, um, What's really cool here is that it can be updated in real time, so it can even react to uh, current events that happened after its initial creation, um, so it felt more personal and, and relatable to the people interacting with it. Okay? And we'll show you how to make that um, in a few slides. <clears throat> so there we go, talking about that. We've seen a lot of inspirational examples from different companies, from Google, from my team. But like, what kind of products and services can you use to get started? Okay. Now, obviously, my background is from the Google ecosystem. You can use whatever you like. But these are the products that I'm familiar with. So I'm just going to give you the lowdown of those. Um, so essentially, this is the ecosystem. You can split it into three parts. You've got the pre-trained models. These are great for people who are new to programming or new to machine learning. Okay. And they're still very powerful, which we'll go into in just a second. You've then got the retrainable models. So if something here does not understand your data set, you can send us your data, and we can retrain our models to then understand your data. And this is private to you. Only you can access these, or you can choose to give it out as an API. It's up to you. You own that data still. Um, but it uses the power of our ML systems to retrain on your data. Okay? And then on the far right-hand side here, we've got the custom models. Um, these are for the ML experts and the high, uh, kind of elite programmers of the world who go really low level. But with this, you can basically uh, build anything you like that maybe doesn't even exist yet different types of uh, neural nets, different structures, that kind of thing. This is about low-level mathematics, the building blocks of machine learning. And we'll go into all of this in just a second. <clears throat> so what can you do with um, the Cloud Vision API? Essentially, you send us an image. This is just a web API. Send us an image, and you get data back of what we can see in that image. What can we tell? Well, essentially, we can do label detection. Um, so if it's an object that Google knows about in that image, we can tell you we've seen that thing. And Google knows about many tens of thousands of objects in the world. So there's a good chance we know generally on a high level what the object might be a class of, like electronics. It won't give you the exact laptop number or something. It's electronics, you know. Um, we can do face detection. And if we see a face in the image, we'll give you the bounding box of where we saw it. And even better, we can tell you the emotion we think we're seeing on the face. Is it angry? Is it happy? Is it sad? Okay. Um, text extraction, optical character recognition, OCR. If there's text in the image, we can extract the text and send that back to you as well. So you can then deal with that as you wish. So maybe you want to do some NLP on there or whatever you want to do. We can detect explicit content. I think that needs no explanation. That makes sense. And then um, landmark and logo detection. So essentially, if we see the Eiffel Tower, we can give you kind of um, um, our knowledge of that entity from our knowledge graph that we have at Google to give you more information about the thing you've just seen. So that's the um, image API. Next up is the natural language API. Essentially, you send us some text, and you get some results back. What can you get? Well, we can do entity recognition, which basically means we can uh, identify people, organi organizations, locations, events, products, and services. So if any of those are in our knowledge graph, we can say we've seen that entity. And it allows you to focus on those words rather than the filler words, like ands, buts, vers, vens, all that kind of stuff. Okay? We can also do sentiment analysis. So if the overall sentiment is positive or negative or neutral, maybe you want to remove negative comments from your, um, your blog or something like this. You can use this as a basic filter for that kind of stuff. 
This is all supported in multiple languages. And for the grammar geeks amongst you, we also do syntax analysis. So if you want to know where the verbs, the nouns, the pronouns are in the sentence, it can break that down for you and actually explain to you how that sentence is made up. Um, <clears throat> speech API. Here, you're sending us audio. And in real time, we're sending back what we're hearing from that audio. This is essentially um, voice to text, right? Um, now, what's cool about this specific API is that it's very robust to noise and it works in real time. And if any of you have used Android phones, even when you're down in a busy bar or restaurant and you ask it like, for the weather or whatever it is, it will still understand you, which is um, not so common in other platforms. Um, this is supported in over 80 languages. And um, even better, it supports word hints as well. So if you have a system that is, um, let's say, a, a video player that is going to be commanded by your voice, you have certain phrases you want to say, play, pause, rewind, fast forward. You can send us those phrases. So in very, very noisy conditions, we have a better chance of understanding that's probably what you said, and we can be slightly biased towards those words. Okay. And then we've got the translation API, which takes text and spits it out in another language. No surprises. That's basically Google Translate, but as an API. And then finally, we've got the Video Intelligence API, which is like the image one, but for videos. You upload a video, it goes through all the frames in the video and tells you what it can see at different frames. So if you've gone to the zoo and you've got this like, really like, long one-hour zoo video that you, with your family, you can just cut out all the bits of pandas and make a panda compilation and do that automatically, okay? stuff like that. Um, and the cool thing about these is that you can use them right now in your web browser. Just go to any of these links, and you can just paste in some text, snap a photo, um, record your voice and see the results that come back. And the reason I am putting this here is that my job is to create MVPs, and sometimes you don't have enough time to make a fully end-to-end uh, -end product. So these can be plugged in initially to get something working until you've actually made a better model. Okay, so maybe uh, the vision piece or the, the speech piece is good enough to get something working in the first couple of months, whilst you're working on a bigger system or when you hire the specialist who can go further in that space. So don't dismiss these immediately just because it's not the coolest TensorFlow stuff. It's actually very, very interesting to use sometimes. And um, you don't have to be a programmer to use these either. You can just try it in your web browser. Um, TensorFlow, as we mentioned, is an open source machine learning library, I think released just over three and a half years ago or so. And um, it's got the building blocks to build anything you like in machine learning. It's down to you to make everything, basically. <laughs> so very low level, and you really need to understand the ins and outs of how uh, ML works to, to use this system. Um, however, if you do use TensorFlow, there are some benefits uh, of doing that with, with the Google infrastructure. So I'm just going to point those out right now. The first thing is cloud CPUs. Typically, when you train machine learning systems, you use graphics cards, okay, or GPUs. Uh, Google has invented a new piece of hardware called a Tensor Processing Unit, TPU. And what might take a graphics card four days to train on like large data sets might take just four hours with a cluster of TPUs, and also very low cost and efficient to use as well. So I believe they only support TensorFlow right now. So in order to use them, you need to write in TensorFlow to utilize that hardware, I believe, at the moment. Um, the other thing to point out is Cloud ML Engine, which I think you're going to be hearing more about uh, later today even. But essentially, um, this allows you not to have to worry about how to scale your systems. So you've got a model that you've built in TensorFlow, and now you've got to deploy it so everyone can query it and get their results at scale on your web servers. That is a hard problem. I was a web engineer before I became a creative engineer. My job was to create large scalable web systems, and it's not trivial to do that robustly with no downtime and all that fun stuff. Cloud ML Engine will scale your model automatically um, so you don't have to worry about the server-side infrastructure. It will just work, no matter if it's one person or 10,000 people accessing it at the same time. And it will only bill you for the amount of usage you have, so it will uh, respond to supply and demand. Okay? So that's potentially good to know about. Um, next up. Is it clicking? Okay. Dialogue flow. This is how we made the Westworld bot, essentially. Okay. This is a really cool online uh, system you can use to create chatbots, conversational assistants, that kind of stuff. And it uses natural language processing behind the scenes to help you out. So if I was making a weather bot, for example, I'd give it some example phrases like, what's the weather today? Okay. And it will then use natural language processing to understand the key parts of those example sentences. So when a new person in the wild says, yo, dude, what's the weather, or how's the weather, something completely different, it will still realize it means the same thing and route it to the same part of your program to deal with that response. Okay? So very easy to use. Um, the second cool thing about this is that 
It's got many one-click deploy points to things like Google Home, Amazon Alexa, Facebook Messenger. Um, these are all supported out of the box within this ecosystem. So it's very easy to deploy uh, at scale. And of course, it scales automatically for you. It handles the server-side stuff as well. So you're just focusing on the AI problem, um, which is great. And this works on web or mobile. So as you can see, um, basically, machine learning data science is a big combination of many different disciplines. My personal background is computer science and cloud computing, and I'm still working on the other ones around here. And it's very rare you'll find someone who knows everything in this diagram. Okay, And it takes time, money, resources. Hopefully, you've got the money now. But you still might need to hire those experts in the other areas you, not, you might not be an expert in yourself to help you go that extra mile. Okay. But if you do, you may just see a big difference in the everyday lives of people you're trying to support and the products and services they're using um, to make it a, a better world overall, right? So with that, um, if you've got any questions, I can take some potentially. Um, and if not, feel free to grab, grab me online. I, I post lots of random technology and all the stuff I'm working with at any point. So thank you very much. Cheers. Mm -hmm.